Richard White, the Margaret Byrne Professor of American History and Director of the Spatial History Lab at Stanford University. He's going to give a public lecture at 4 o'clock on April 2nd entitled California Time. And he's going to have a seminar on the 3rd at 3 o'clock called Visualizing Narratives. And I encourage you to come invite your advanced graduate students, not so advanced graduate students, to come to the seminar as well. There's a meeting that he posted on our website, and you can get a hold of that. Um, and um, we're going to send out a note, or we're maybe even today send out a note for faculty who are interested in forming new working groups. And um, as you know, we have a lot of different working groups here at the Institute, so keep your eye open for that. Now I'd like to ask my colleague Molly Doan from the Department of Anthropology to introduce our speaker today. Hi. Um, I'm so happy to introduce our speaker today. As some of you may know, um, this is the first year that um, we have had um, this postdoctoral fellowship at UIC. And uh, some of you are on the committee, include, I was also, that selected this postdoc. And um, it, was, it was incredibly competitive. We had over 100 applicants um, and maybe 30 or 35 that were wonderful. So it was, it was really, really hard to, um, to pick somebody, and um, we, we ended up picking Ariela Zeitman, um, who is speaking today, and um, we couldn't be happier. She's just been wonderful to have here. Um, she's been very active here in the um, Humanities Institute and participating um, in the seminar, um, but she's also been really active in the anthropology program with our students um, as a teacher, and it's just been, she's really brought some life <laughs> to, to um, UIC, so I'm really happy um, that, that we got her. Um, so I want to just tell you a few things about her before she speaks. Um, Ariella has a PhD in applied anthropology from Columbia University. Her dissertation, is called The Changing Value of Food, Localizing Modernity Among Simane of Lowland Bolivia. Um, her uh, dissertation advisors were um, um, Lambros Comitas and Paige West. Um, and um, that dissertation was hot off the press when she arrived here. And so this year, Ariel has been working on um, a book, which is um, uh, the same title as this talk, Shifting Recipes, Changing Environments, and Maintenance of the Familiar in Lowland Bolivia. Um, and she's been working on uh, a number of papers, including um, one that's been submitted to Food and Foodways, and um, another manuscript that is um, destined for food, culture, and society, um, that actually won a graduate student paper prize from the Association for the Study of Food and Society. And then the next step is to make it um, a, a peer-reviewed pub published paper. Um, she has, um, Ariella has also many um, other awards and honors, both from Columbia, from the Earth Institute, <coughs> from the FLAS, and um, that have enabled her to carry out her research and studies um, on her topic. Um, some of the publications that sh she already has out include um, uh, No Thanks, I Don't Eat Meat, Vegetarian Adventures in Beef-Centric Argentina, which came out in an edited volume called Adventures in Eating, and to Beef or Not to Beef, Defining Food Security and Insecurity in Tucumán, Argentina, published in the Journal of Ecological and Environmental Anthropology. Um, so um, I guess without further ado, I will, um, I will ask you to join me in welcoming Ariela Zeiterman. Thanks, Molly, for the introduction, and thank you, Sue and Linda, 
for a great year, and thank you to all the fellows. It's been really fun getting to know you, and thank you to the committee um, for the Food Studies Working Group for inviting me here for the year. So, studies of globalization, culture, and food tend to take two approaches. The first argues that a global spread of capitalism and Western-led media will lead to cultural homogenization on the global scale. This approach expects that in the near distant future, those in cities will feast on McDonald's, KFC, and Starbucks, supplied by the products of large-scale agribusiness, while those rural inhabitants will abandon subsistence practices to engage in industrialized product production and rely, will rely primarily on commodity goods. The second approach argues the second approach argues that despite globalization's strong armed economic force, its impacts on culture differ from, differ from place to place, leading to or maintaining cultural heterogeneity. From this approach, you encounter hybridity, creolization, and alternatives like the slow food movement, which manifest through negotiation and resistance to global powers, but often find ways to disregard continued engagement with the global. Inglis and Gimlin have argued that choosing just one of these approaches would simplify the complexity of the issues. Instead, they propose a definition for food globalizations, a plural approach to understanding the relationship between globalization, food, and culture. They define food globalizations as the multiple modes of interaction of the economic, political, social, and cultural dimensions of globalization. So, i.e., the forces, processes, institutions, structures, actors, networks, etc., as these affect food-related matters, and as the latter in turn come to affect the former in a series of ongoing dialect dialectical relations characterized by the constant generation of forms of complexity. So while this definition allows for a more dynamic approach, many studies continue to focus on direct global relationships where the movement of food or people is a more obvious demonstration of the broader political, economic, social, and cultural dimensions of food. So for example, what is the taco? How did it get from Mexico to the United States and back again? Or what is the relationship between quinoa consumers in New York and the diets of quinoa growers in the Bolivian highlands? But what about places where the movement of food or the movement of people is less clear, when the scale of globalization is muddled as it's filtered through local processes, when their direct ties are not clearly to food-related matters, but somehow food matters change? Are these not food globalizations too? I'm interested in understanding food globalizations in places where global relationships are abstract, meaning changes to political, environmental, economic, and social relationships seemingly stem from regional and national processes, yet often relate to, seri to, to series of more subtle global relationships over time. An example of this might be built, um, building a road, or the arrival of electricity, or conservation projects. These processes often have little to do with food, yet somehow, and often in indirect ways, impact local foodways. I'm interested in re-embedding food in these discussions, and more specifically, looking at the ways these abstract forms of globalization affect the foodways of rural and indigenous subsistence populations. Um, scholars of indigenous foodways have argued that food is central to indigenous well-being, not only because of the inclusion of local ingredients in the diet, but also because of its socio-cultural significant, significance, relationship to the environment, techniques of acquisition and processing, and their use. Globalization threatens indigenous food waste as knowledge and the consumption of traditional foods change as the local environment and daily activities shift, particularly livelihood procurement and an increase in wage labor, augmenting the availability of food not produced locally. So what insight do these ways that change do the ways that these changes take shape in everyday life offer to the understanding of the ways globalized processes are negotiated? My research on the changing diet of the Chimani Indians of the Bolivian Amazon demonstrate that although broader regional changes have altered Chimani life, particularly the environment and livelihood production, other techniques, namely cooking, are able to transform these changes into more familiar cultural practices that are meaningful for cultural longevity acting as buffers and softening the impacts of these changes on everyday family life, while simultaneously facilitating engagement in an increasingly global world. These are the forms of dynamic and complex food globalizations Inglis and Gimlin speak about, yet come to light without the giant mega-rhythms of globalization 
that come from programmatic development and industrialization. So to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about, um, first I'm going to introduce the Chimani in the region of Bolivia where I do my work, and then I'll review the change the changes in the region making connections between globalized processes and their regional realizations. Then I'll discuss the Chimani diet and the relationship from these processes to the diet, talking not only about shifts, the consumption of particular food items, but also the ways that cooking, or perhaps more specifically the form prepared dishes take, fold these changes into everyday life. And then finally, I will conclude by discussing how the project not only draws attention to those areas not typically thought of as experiencing globalization, but also offers an alternative way of thinking about food security through the act of cooking. So there are about 15,000 Chimani Indians living in the Beni province of the western Bolivian Amazon, near the towns of San Borja and Nkumo. The Chimani have experienced continuous exposure to outsiders since the late 17th century when Jesuit missionaries arrived. Early global market relationships included the extraction of quinine, rubber, and Brazil nuts from their territory. While only engaging moderately in these extractive trades, Chimani were exposed to market goods like tools, clothing, and sugar, and traded their forest products to access them. However, the Chimani kept some distance from the market and continued to primarily practice farming, fishing, hunting, and gathering for subsistence. Today, food production and the maintenance of food-centric traditions remain central to daily life, formulating social, economic, political, and environmental relationships. So only more recently has regional development compelled the Chimani to engage with outsiders in a market economy more regularly. Development in the region spanning the last 60 years has included the expansion of cattle ranches, the arrival of evangelical missionaries, a population boom stemming from a large influx of highland migrants, and the extraction of timber by private corporate concessions and small-scale extractors. These developments have not only changed the environmental landscape through new systems of land tenure and shifts in biodiversity, but have also led to the expansion of local markets for both commodities and locally produced materials. Chimani have begun to look beyond the forest to the town markets to augment food, household supplies, and recently uh, regularly engage in cash occurring activities like cash cropping and logging to afford these commodities. So in the late 19th century, following the collapse of the rubber boom, cattle ranching expanded in the region as Lebanese immigrants, Europeans, and their mestizo descendants began to settle the area. Through national land reform in the 1950s, these cattle ranches were able to officially own and expand their large tracts of land, in turn fracturing expansive forested areas and animal habitats. For decades, Chimani families have worked seasonally for the cattle ranchers, primarily as slash and burn technicians, in charge of cultivating, har cultivating and harvesting crops to support the ranch or planting sod for the cows to eat. Meanwhile, because of limited government presence in Beni, missionaries found the opportunity to take on organizational leadership positions and arrived in the region to work with the Chimani in a variety of capacities. Catholic missionaries arriving in the 1950s aimed to create increased economic activity for the Chimani and hoped to facilitate more equitable economic relationships between the Chimani and the ranchers. Alternatively, the Evangelical New Tribes Mission, which arrived in the 1960s from the United States, concentrated on religious studies, health, and education, creating agricultural development projects, health clinics, a radio station, and bilingual schools. As a result of their wide programming, the New Tribes Mission spread their influence through systematic changes over a larger population than the Catholic Mission did, which quickly disappeared. For example, the creation of schools guided settlement patterns because the school served as nuclei around which permanent communities arose. Chimani, who were historically semi-nomadic and spent significant parts of their time visiting families in other areas, hunting and fishing, began to settle not only around the schools but in communities closer to the towns where the schools were located. Permanent settlements led to a decline in local biodiversity surrounding the permanent settlements because of more dense and continuous uses of the land for slash and burn agriculture, as well as hunting and fishing. The land reform that facilitated the expansion of cattle ranching also redistributed land to peasant farmers and indigenous peoples from the highlands, and began the colonizing process of moving people from the overpopulated highlands to the uninhabited lowlands. 
Initially, this government resettlement program did not affect Chumayan territory because of difficulty accessing the area. But in 1970 and early 1980, roads in and around the region were built, and the National Colonizing Institute was granted 275,000 acres of land. Subsequently, miners and landless peasants from the highlands arrived, and many of these colonists failed at the rice production agriculture venture intended for them by the national government. Instead, they found success as merchants in the area and grew the market towns of San Borja and Yukumo. In addition to migrants, the roads facilitated the entrance of large-scale logging concessions to the area, and these concessions worked freely in the region in the 1970s and the 1980s, ultimately leading to the exhaustion of mahogany and other precious woods demanded abroad. In 1990, weary of the occupation and exploitation of their forests, indigenous tribes from across the lowlands organized a 600-kilometer march from Trinidad, the capital of Beni, to the state capital of La Paz, known as the March for Land and Dignity. Although very few Chimani participated in this march, they were some of the first to benefit from its outcome. So following the March for Land and Dignity, the Supreme Court passed multiple decrees like the Agrarian Reform Law, which recognized indigenous lands and created a legal status for indigenous territories known as Tierra Comunitaria de Origen, or TCOs. And this law designated indigenous lands as collective properties where inhabitants have the right to sustainably exploit natural resources in the, in the territory. The Grand Consejo Chimán, the Chimani Governing Council, or organized with the help of the new tribe's mission, was able to successfully apply for TCO status, and the TCO Chimani Chimán, most commonly known as the TCO Chimani, was established, and today some, something like 70% of all Chimani live in this territory. So additionally, a forest <coughs> law created regulations to control deforestation and the exploitation of non-timber forest resources. This law reduced the number of large forestry concessions working throughout the entire lowland area. And while the laws were successful in reducing the rate of deforestation nationally by decreasing the overall number of forestry concessions, the concessions that remained functioned unregulated and were known for clandestinely pushing the boundaries of their concessional territories, as well as exceeding the harvest limits of their management plans. So three large forestry concessions were able to maintain operations until 2011 on the frontiers of the newly established TCO, which so the red, well, just for all intents and purposes, I put the green circle to show the original Chimani territory, which actually expands farther, farther east, and then the red circle is the TCO Chimani, which was established in the 90s. And then these blue circles are the forestry concessions, and you can see how they sort of hug the TCO Chimani and don't allow for expansion of the territory, rather a continuous reduction of the territory. Um, so these three large forestry concessions were able to maintain operations until 2011 on the frontiers of the TCO Chimani. And legal and illegal logging by highland migrants has continued inside the TCO since the 90s. So since the 1950s, regional foods, especially hunted meats and fish, have become more difficult to secure, and exposure to a host of commodities have made them more desirable. To secure a livelihood, many Chimani have shifted not only the type of subsistence activities they practice, but have augmented the type of cash accruing activities they take part in. Chimani continue to rely primarily on traditional farming activities, hunting, fishing, and gathering. But it's not simply the types of activities they take part in, but also the ways they allot their time to these activities and what they inevitably produce. While men and women share responsibilities in agriculture, men hold the major responsibility for providing meat and fish for the household. Men often talk about their responsibility to buy grocery items in association with the need for cash. For example, Jose, a man in his mid-60s, described how as a young man he worked sporadically on a ranch and then as an assistant and guide to a traveling trader. But now he works harder selling plantains and working on logging contracts with his son. He said, we need so much more money now. Before we relied on the forest and the river more, there used to be animals and lots of fish that were bigger, and it wasn't difficult to catch them. Now we have to buy our goods. Charqui, which is dried beef, pasta, oil, and sugar, and it costs a lot of money. There are no fish and no animals. There's nothing here. We need the cash to survive because there is no food. Plantains and rice, that's not food. There is no food, and that is why people are working with wood to make money. So, as the Chimani become more integrated into the market economy, they become more reliant on their agricultural production. 
Recently, in addition to rice, plantains have become an important cash and food crop. So rice was brought to the region in the 17th century by the Jesuit missionaries, while plantains seem to have made their way to the Americas in the late 15th century with the early explorers. As plant and rice became more central, other previously important crops like manioc and maize are planted with less frequency and in smaller amounts. While rice is sold once or twice a year after the harvest, demand for plantains is constant and traders come to the communities directly or to the ports of the rivers to purchase plantains. These plantains go to small local cities where populations are growing. Chimani farmers are expanding their plantain areas to be able to meet the demand and maintain a steady flow of cash throughout the year. So many sell between five and a hundred bunches two times per month. In 2010, in the communities of Iwasichi and Maratha, the communities I primarily do my research in, um, I chose them because of their location within the TCO, they're about one day's travel to town, and they have a continued reliance on the forest and subsistence activities while also regularly engaging in the market economy. But in these communities, the majority of families selling plantains and slightly less than half of the families selling rice did so specifically in order to purchase other foodstuffs. The foodstuffs regularly purchased are charqui, pasta, onion, salt, flour, sugar, and oil, foods which have become staples in the diet. So some of these foods, like the charqui, onion, and salt, are locally or nationally produced, while the pasta, oil, and sugar come from abroad, from Peru and Brazil. In addition to wage labor on the ranches, the Chimani households are also, are also engaging in their own logging contracts. Using President Eva Morales' rhetoric on indigenous empowerment, decolonization, and indigenous uses of natural resources, Chimani have not only begun to see logging as a way for them to access cash, but also as a way for them to keep outsiders from entering and exploiting their territories. However, ultimately, this wood is still handled by the migrant highlanders acting as middlemen between the carpentry shops in other regions that supply products domestically and abroad. To fulfill these contracts, men now leave the community for six days at a time from anywhere, from one week to five, to complete a contract, returning for the weekends in between and almost immediately traveling to town to restock gas and food before heading back into the forest. Frequently, the men leave the women at home without any stocks of fish and meat while they're in the forest. And alternatively, while the men are in the forest, they rely on canned sardines and pasta. While agricultural money goes most often to groceries, medicines, and other household necessities, money from logging primarily is saved and invested in larger durable goods like chainsaws, generators, and boat motors. New labor patterns of selling plantains and selling wood have, increasing, have increased income in the household, and more often than in the past, households are able to supplement their diets with commodities purchased in town. For example, while fish and animal consumption goes down from the dry season when the water levels are low and it's easier to spot animals or catch fish, in the wet season it's much more difficult. Um, historically, this results in what some call seasonal starvation. But now in the wet season, commodity consumption goes up. So there's charqui, oil, pasta, and other food, store-fought food, foods that fill in the gaps. But despite more access to food in the wet season, these commodities aren't always distributed equally. So there's an abundance of plantains and there are commodity goods, but most of the men take it with them when they're going to work in wood or on the ranches, and they leave the women and the children to fend for themselves. So on the one hand, development in the region since the 1950s has impacted diet, particularly the availability of certain forest-based food items. But on the other hand, new forms of labor continue shifting what types of foods are produced or purchased for household consumption. These processes not only change what foods Chimani eat, but also how they think about food. So for example, historically Chimani don't eat the capybara, which is a giant rodent because it's believed to have shamanistic powers and possess a a powerful bewitching venom stemming from its origin as an anthropomorphic being. Over time, the myth evolved to just restrict consumption of the head because the spiritual powers are supposed to reside in the nose. But now, Chimani happily eat the entire capybara if they're lucky enough to successfully hunt one. And this particular capybara was my neighbor's pet, which they were growing and eventually ate. Um, but he was my friend. We went swimming together a lot. Um, <laughs> So now, I, I asked Pilar, an 80-year-old midwife and former shaman's apprentice, why it's now permissible to eat capybara while it wasn't in the past, and she answered, 
that the grandfathers did not eat many things. They did not eat capybara, they did not eat porcupine, or even a possum. But people eat them now because there isn't a lot of food, so it's permissible to eat anything. So as Pilar explained, changing access to food shifts how people understand food. So what is the relationship <coughs> between what people think about food and what they actually eat in changing environments? To answer this, I use data, data from cultural domain analysis, a cognitive method designed to elicit knowledge and, pro and prominency of items in a given domain, in this case, food. So to do this, I conducted 53 free lists at, asking the simple question, what did Chimani eat? Which resulted in a compiled list of 276 food items. Subsequently, I conducted pile sorts, asking informants to group a selection of these items into piles of similar items to understand how they are categorized and thought about. But to compare ideas and knowledge of food to actual consumption, I conducted 24-hour dietary recalls over the wet and dry seasons in all 17 kitchens in one of the two communities, generating a record of 561 meals and less formal eating times. Chimani maintained vast knowledge of forest foods and continued to value them. In David Sutton's discussion of food and memory, he points out, if we are what we eat, then we are what we ate as well. The Chimani's ability to list significantly more foods than they currently eat perform this truism and connects current dietary practices to a more varied past diet and its relationship to the forest as a food source. Um, key informants place these foods into groups and the overwhelming majority, 88% of the foods mentioned in the free lists, are raw ingredients obtained through hunting, gathering, fishing, and agriculture and present a, di a picture of a diet rich in variety. 7% of the lists are commodity items purchased in town. 2.5% of the list are domesticated animals separated out as a home-based food source, and 2.5% of the list were prepared foods. The subsequent pile sort exercise demonstrated that people thought of food related to how each item is acquired, and there was a lot of agreement about topics related to animals, fish, and fruits. But agricultural products like plantains and rice had much less agreement as to whether or not they fit into the agricultural pile or the market pile. The list was analyzed for the frequency of items mentioned and their saliency, which is, which is not only a measure of frequency, but also of average rank. And so here are the top 15 free listed foods ordered by frequency and the top 15 free list, listed foods ordered by saliency. So the lists are very similar, but there are two differences that are worth noting. So the first is the disappearance of manioc, which is ori from 10, and it drops in saliency to, I think, 22. Um, and this is a clear example of how a food might be known to many people, but its declining presence in everyday life moves down as a salient item. So it's something that becomes less valued as it's consumed less. In the same way, on an alternate scale, you see the rise of, um, of three animals. So the brown capuchin monkey, the collared peccary, and the gray rocket deer move up. So, collared peccary is one of the most common hunted animals, and uh, the, anim the deer is also pretty common, but the capuchin monkey was rarely seen as eaten. Um, so the fact that these animals rise to the top of the list in saliency perhaps demonstrates something else, that even though they're frequently seen or not frequently seen, that there's something else happening here, that it's about the action of hunting, the value of an animal that makes them more important as a food source, even if they're not consumed as regularly. Um, and this is sort of important because while fish play a much, a much more significant role in the Chimani diet, and they're consumed much more regularly than hunted animals, overall, Individual fish are ranked slightly lower in saliency than in frequency. So even though they're consumed more often, they're still not as important as animals. And so that says something about how people are thinking about preferable foods in the minds of the Chimani. So despite a breadth of foods Chimani identify as things that they can eat, only 88 items were recorded as consumed. And 70 of these items were mentioned in 2% or fewer of the dietary recalls, meaning that they were rarely consumed. So many, it's really important to note that many of these 70 items that were 2% or less 
present in the recall um, were domesticated fruits, fish, and collected fruits. And those are eaten seasonally and not in large amounts, while the fish, there's a kind of a, a luck factor of what's constantly available and what sometimes happens to swim by. So you can't expect those to be all the time, but their presence is still important. But what you get from this is that Shimani continue to produce the majority of their foods through fishing and slash and burn agriculture, but increasingly slash and burn agriculture is producing cash crops. But the results of the dietary re recalls imply a much higher dependency on commodity food items that the three lists imply. So the vast majority of dietary recalls incorporated plantains in one form or another, while rice is present in just over a quarter of all recalls, and cooking oil is in 22% of recalls. The remaining 12 items were consumed with much less regularity, and one thing that's not evident here but is important is that fresh fish as an all-encompassing umbrella category was present in 33% of recalls. So besides plantains, the most commonly eaten thing is fresh fish, whatever kind of fish it is. However, when it comes to animal meat, Chimani are relying much more heavily on the market commodity charqui, which was present in 17% of the dietary recalls, compared to the total composite umbrella amount of meat of wild hunted animals, which was only 11%. So there's significantly more fish than there are animals, and there's significantly more charqui than there are animals. So clearly there's some discrepancies between what Chimani value as food and what they actually eat. Pasta and charqui offer an interesting example of these. So these purchased foods are eaten frequently in Chimani households, as you can see. Um, but despite their reasonably high frequency output, they're still only ranked in saliency. Pasta is at 41 and charqui is at 43. After a slew of fish and animals, some of which hunters report as very rare and even locally extinct, like the white-lipped peccary. So what's important about this? Well, I think it's possible that the continued importance of hunted animals reflects larger relationships to food than just what is consumed. Perhaps the act of hunting and the knowledge of foodstuffs remain more valuable than the commodity foods, which although are consumed, lack sociocultural importance. So if the Chimani think of their diet as broad and forest-based, yet the reality is one more limited and filled with market items, how do they maintain some sort of medium, one that reflects the past importance of social roles in the collection of food and connects them to the forest, but simultaneously acts as a vehicle for contemporary foods? Well, I think they do this through cooking and the shifting of recipes that maintain the form of traditional dishes while incorporating different ingredients. So I'll... Oh, so I'll explain this through the examples of two prepared foods, hona and shogja, which are consumed regularly by the Chimani. Um, so hona is the most typical dish consumed in Morocco, and um, they're very, it's very unappealing looking, but it's actually very delicious. Um, it's most often described as a thick plantain stew boiled with fresh fish. But as I will show, although that is how it's most commonly made, it's very limited definition of the dish, past and present. Chimani women consistently list the dish as one of the most important Chimani foods and can make it as often as three times a day, seven days a week. Hona has nutritional significance because it functions as one of the major suppliers of Chimani vitamins and calories and acts as a vehicle to stretch the day's provisions, particularly limited proteins to reach members of large households which are multiple families that share a kitchen and eat from a communal pot. Um, also, another way that this is important for nutrition is that it's boiled with the bones, so calcium comes in that in, through that, and there aren't that many other ways they get that particular nutrient. Hona has changed over time, but the cooking technique has remained the same. Boil the protein, fish, poultry, or meat for about 20 minutes, then add the starch and boil for another 20 minutes until thick and soft, and then add, add salt. While continuing to define hona as a thick soup made from river fish and green plantains, some Chimani recall that when they were young, their mothers or they themselves included manioc or maize as the starchy and creamy soup base. Today, these ingredients are never included, and instead women rely on plantains and rice because of, of their availability, and even on occasion, replace plantains with pasta or pasta and rice mixed together. 
While Hona originally included more equivalent proportions of game and fish to starch, today river fish are smaller and more difficult to catch, and wild animals even more so. So smaller and fewer fish are balanced with larger amounts of plantains to make a little meat go a long way. A typical Hona cooked to serve an average household of five adults and six children includes 12 green plantains and about one kilo of fish, so that's not very much. But this, of course, changes between seasons with availability. So river fish like Wona, which is maybe more commonly known as Sabalo, maintains its importance as a central ingredient, but charqui is also a, a primary ingredient as it's the most common animal protein brought into the house. Today, Hona of rice and charqui is consumed with almost as much frequency as Hona of plantains and fish. New commodity ingredients are added, such as onions and oil if available. And sometimes river fish are replaced with canned sardines, particularly among men working in the forest and away from home who are tasked with cooking work typically done by their wives, mothers, and daughters. But even among men, the form of Hona remains the same. And the pasta is boiled and until it's so thick and soft that pieces are practically indistinguishable from one another. And although the ingredients have changed over time, Hona remains important as a filling dish that feeds very large extended families. So in the dietary histories I conducted, which is when you ask people to, to discuss their relationship with food over time, not unlike a life history, but more centered, Hona was a reference point for broader changes to ingredients and the diet in general. The continuous preparation of meals through the technique of Hona is one way that Shimani localized their experiences with globalization. These changes represent larger shifts in Shimani life related to the environment, interactions with the marketplace, and labor. The replacement of manioc and maize with plantains, and then the addition of rice and purchased starches maintains the role of Hona as an important dish that demonstrates the ways these changes are negotiated through the transformation of materials in community and home life. In the dietary recalls when people mention Hona, and I asked what it was, People sometimes described a dish made from charqui and rice or sardines and pasta, but these ingredients did not come up in opposition or in contrast to past ingredients, but rather new forms of a familiar dish. Hona, or rather the technique of cooking Hona, remains a steady practice from past diets to present diets, maintaining its form despite changing ingredients. Hona, therefore, not only embodies larger change, but also serves to sustain familiarity over time through patterns of cooking and consumption. So while Hona is primarily a dish served as a meal and shared among members of the household, Shogja, which is more commonly in Spanish referred to as chicha, is a fermented beer that's shared with an entire community and anyone who comes to visit the home. So women typically make beer once or twice a month, but it's available somewhere in the community in someone's home almost any day of the month. Traditionally, Chimani make the beer with fermented manioc that's mixed with boiled and ground corn. It takes between two and five days to make the beer, which requires cutting, boiling, masticating, spitting, and straining the yuca before letting it sit to ferment before mixing in the corn. It's the mix of these two ingredients which makes the Chimani beer different from other beers in the region. One interesting detail is that in the pile sorts, these two items, manioc and maize, were grouped together within the agricultural pile with a very, very high level of agreement compared to bananas, plantains, and rice. And when I asked people to explain why these two things go together, they always said it's because they make chokja. So there's clearly a relationship between the cooking and the, and the items themselves. So chokja is important for Chimani nutritiously, culturally, and socially. On an individual level, shogja is an important food source, providing a steady and portable source of energy that provides useful caloric value from the dense carbohydrates. Chimani also do not regularly drink water and rely on shogja for hydration and to quench their thirst. And children's consumption of shogja provides additional nutrition as the unfermented beverage is fed to them before they begin to eat solid food. So it's sort of chimani baby food. Shogja has a spiritual importance from its material base, sweet manioc. According to the myths, manioc was a gift from the gods to the Chimani and was an improvement in taste and quality over pre-existing tubers. Furthermore, the knowledge that women possessed to masticate, chewing, and then spitting the manioc in order to ferment it was also a gift from the gods to the women, entrusting them to maintain a spiritual relationship between the gods and the Chimani through its production. 
Historically, shoja was offered by the shaman to the supernatural to thank the gods or to ask the gods for successful hunting, fishing, and agricultural seasons. But as the Chimani settled into permanent communities and began relying more on agriculture than hunted animals, the need for this sort of offering faded, and so did the role of the shaman. Shoja is also important because it facilitates social relationships between households and within households. Within households, shoja maintains a balance between women and men's responsibilities as providers. Women and men have particular jobs, but each job is intricately connected. While hunting and fishing are primarily the responsibility of men, women are responsible for distributing meat if appropriate, preparing and cooking food, and serving the shoja. When a hunter comes home, with or without game, his wife offers him shoja as a way to finish the hunting cycle. In this way, when a man does his job, it's not completed without the participation of a woman. Between households, shogja maintains connections with others by facilitating the distribution of game, but also by facilitating visiting. Shogja plays a central role in Shimani social life, maintaining the ritual of sobaki, or visiting, in which people go to others' homes to have shogja. Shimani will not visit other homes for extended periods of time without the presence of the drink. This practice of visiting others' homes is how Chimani know other people and maintain networks, but it's also how they learn and exchange information about social worlds and environments. Although the ceremonial uses of shogja has faded, shogja continues to be served after a long day in the field, after a hunt, and after a meal. However, sort of unsurprising at this point, plantains have replaced manioc as the key ingredient in shogja. In fact, when manioc and maize is available, it's hardly ever given the chance to ferment, so it never really gets alcoholic. On the one hand, this decline in the beer is correlated with the decline of the importance of the shaman who required the manioc to be successful. But on the other hand, it's also related to changes in agriculture and the concentration on particularly important commercial crops and the related decline of non-fungible crops. And the changes in the production and consumption of shoja might also relate to more stressful circumstances and the inability to allow the time for the beer to ferment before consumption. The plantain beer is historically called kanabja pere, which means literally cooked plantains. And it's now commonly referred to as shogja pere, which is plantain beer. Referring to kanabja as shogja elevates its social importance and places it in the same role as beer. Yet spiritually, it remains peripheral. While the preparation time is similar, the plantain chicha is not masticated. And while it gets fairly sour, it never reaches the same alcoholism, the alcohol level as manioc. It's significant that plantains are not masticated like manioc because the techniques for masticating were a gift to, the, to women from the gods. However, with men spending more time participating in logging and agriculture, combined with the decline in local animal populations, hunting has become a less frequent activity. So while men continue to bring home meat, it's most commonly dried beef purchased in town. And as I mentioned earlier, Charky, Charky has a less social capital than wild meat, and in many ways doesn't deserve the celestial importance of a masticated beer. So after purchasing domestic meat, there are no hunting stories to tell, no gods to thank, and nothing to be distributed. Shogja pere, made from a sellable commodity, is a much more appropriate response to purchase dried beef. So Shogja continues to retain its social importance, and it continues to demonstrate, create, and maintain social relationships between and within households. Despite changes to the ingredients of Shogja, for many women it's important to continue producing Shogja to maintain their social roles, social roles in the house and between the houses. The social result of plantain beer is different from manioc beer, but with the changes in gender roles, plantain beer still allows a woman to maintain her responsibility at home in the context of new circumstances. So in summary, I've described the regional changes that have, take, that have taken place and shifted how the Chimani are able to produce their livelihood. A long history of outsiders in the region, shifting land tenure patterns and the exploitation of local natural resources have resulted in changes to how the Chimani access food and what foods they have access to. Market activities continue to shift patterns of food availability, and these changes are becoming more profound as new labor opportunities emerge. Yet despite a sharp rise in market commodities and a decline in hunted fish and gathered products, Chimani maintain a deep knowledge of the forest and what it produces. 
For the Chimani, knowing the foods that they can eat and have eaten in the past is almost as important as eating the foods themselves. To maintain inter- and intra-household relationships, Chimani transform market commodities into common and historically prepared dishes. Cooking acts as a way to reshape the unfamiliar into the familiar, and recipes are flexible enough to adjust to changing ingredients while maintaining familiar forms. So what does this mean for studies of globalization? Well, first, this project demonstrates globalization is experienced in unequal ways. It does not always arrive through fast food chains or the, the arrival of an oil company, but instead it can be experienced through abstract forms which shift environmental, political, economic, and social relationships, perhaps indirectly, and they change local food systems. Examples like that of the Chimani are also food globalizations, but are not often acknowledged as, acknowledged as such because their foods are not recognized as developed cuisine or are not industrialized or sent into a global marketplace. However, globalization has been occurring slowly and subtly for centuries. Understanding this slow and indirect global process is important for changing rural and indigenous foodways, which are threatened by globalization but only acknowledged as such when there is a clear threat. Second, while changing indigenous diets are often thought about in terms of loss, loss of nutritional value, loss of knowledge, loss of autonomy, this is a singular trope of loss and is much too it is much too narrow to, to advance into the complexity of the context of globalization. While there is clearly a reduction in the diversity of foodstuffs and an overwhelming presence of plantains, there are also negotiations, resistance, and gains central to the ways globalization takes root. As Mary Douglas pointed out many years ago, meals and cooking are representative of other larger systems. Chimani, Chimani balance global impacts with culturally important practices maintaining knowledge of foodstuffs they no longer eat regularly because it connects them to other activities in the forest, demonstrating that food matters are not simply about those foods consumed, but rather about the environments they are situated in. And they fold new ingredients and traditional forms of cooking, not only demonstrating an attachment to the social relationships these forms of cooking facilitate, but also acknowledging the broad forms of change and the new forms of livelihoods that produce them. So to conclude, I offer the idea that this use of familiar cooking practices is not only useful to think, but is also useful to eat. As Jeffrey Pilcher has argued, iconic recipes exist only on the pages of cookbooks. In practice, they are adapted constantly to suit available ingredients. Chimani cooking of important recipes is a method to maintain congruency between the past, present, and future, while simultaneously adapting to contemporary circumstances and formulating a new sense of modernity. The maintenance of traditionally important dishes and drinks creates continuity over time, keeps social relationships relevant, and also demonstrates engagements with new worlds. Perhaps in the wake of all this change, shifting recipes can be thought of as a method to achieve food security, making sure that the kinds of foods that Chimani actually eat are the foods that they want to be eating. You sure do. Thank you. <laughs>
So I wasn't always sure. So I just wanted to know if there was a fish, and then I sometimes ask, you know, what size was it? How many fish? And there was some generalizations that I learned over time that I would be able to sort of guesstimate if it was not totally out of the, the blue or not. And so was there a difference in what people reported and what they actually ate, as best you can tell? I don't think so. I think people were fairly honest about it. Yeah. Oh, um, so I wanted to hear more about some of the metrics and how they're being used. So there was frequency versus saliency. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to hear more about how saliency is measured and how frequency was measured because it went by a little bit. Uh, so, I'm oh, sorry. So, frequency, um, I had 53 informants, and frequency, if it was mentioned by the number of informants. So, you can see Ibiki, Achachiru, it's, um, it doesn't exist anywhere else, but it's in a similar family as um, the Lichi or the Rambutan. Um, but, so why that's at the top is a whole other issue about um, seasonality. But you can see the frequency is 48 people mentioned this. So you were, they were given a list of 53 to choose from? No, 53 no, people. Just, so I said, sorry, oh yeah, sorry, so that was the I, I said, tell me all the things that Chimani eats. So Got some it, of okay. my lists were 200, Got some it, of okay. my lists were 15. Got it. But 48 out of 53 people mentioned this item. All right. The saliency is, it mixes, well, it combines the average rank with the amount of, um, with the, the frequency of it being noted. So it's, I don't know exactly how the, metric, how the math works, but send it through a program and it tells them saliency. So saliency <laughs> is the, it's, it's the average rank times the frequency at some, at some very small measure. And so you can see the average rank of kiti of the collar peccary is 14 and 18. So it's it's not the highest ranked thing. Its average rank is not the highest, but it's that height in terms of men, um, people mentioned it as the 14th item times, but it's not really times, in collaboration with it being mentioned by 44 people. Okay. Uh, so were they asked um, for the first Part of that. They're asked one thing. So this is two different analysis of the same lists. Okay. So the, the lists are lined up yeah. in the matrix. And so they're, the, the lists are lined up. And I can run it for frequency, which is a ta mostly just a tally. Yeah. Then when you run it for saliency, it's the tally and its average rank combined. Got it. Okay. So they actually rank the foods as well as giving you a number. No, they don't rank. They don't rank. But that's what I the cognitive it's a cognitive method. So the idea is that the high the, the more quickly you you say it, you oh, say it it's see. more important in some way. So the first thing they think it's of like is what's off the top of your mind. So if it's if it's I number see. like two hundred, they assume it's then, then it's not really important. It's something that you know, but it's not something that you really engage with regularly. Right, that's that's the that's bit I wasn't getting. Yeah, the rank that. was taken as a measure of uh, importance. So um, I, I was interested. You mentioned religion off and on, and uh, where people have not uh, been sucked into cash copying as much. Um, I'm thinking of the Northwest Amazon when the Hugh Joneses did their dissertations, uh, and, and there's uh, oh, for example, uh, to hunt in the morning. I think a shot on that one. Um, people valued food for other than just its nutritional um, frequency or even taste because they, it was in food choice, it was mediated partly by shaman, uh, it had to do with health, spiritual health, but also your status um, relate, relating to blood, so whether you had killed somebody or something, or had a baby, or had menstruated. And so um, you couldn't eat certain foods at certain times because of all those considerations. But then also, um, in Hunt in the Morning, and I think the Murphys look on the, uh, together with the, on the Moon of the Coup, the uh, value of certain animals like peccary weren't big in the diet had something to do with the way men have to develop their identity and the way women want them to. Because the women have a lot of lot to say about that men should go hunting, even though it's not big in the diet, really, usually. Fish, 
are almost always really, really much bigger by quantity. But it has to do with um, souls, because uh, Reichel Dompa, for example, looks at the way people talk about and use animals in relation to a concept of souls, of death and of new births kind of thing, relating to what animals have been killed and in what quantity. So I'm wondering, um, how much impact does the Christianity have on the way they look at things? Sometimes people can incorporate a lot of a new religion and still there's this backdrop of the indigenous one. And I'm just wondering, um, what has happened? Well, um, so the Catholic missionaries really didn't seem to have a big impact, but the evangelicals had a, hum a humongous impact. And one of the things that they did was sort of demonize all of the animal gods. So the animal gods and the fish gods and the bird gods. And, and they also reimagined the Chimani you know, creation stories and told them that was nonsense and mm -hmm. things like that. And, and, you know, it's hard to say exactly what happened, but it seems to be a mixture of things. So like I mentioned, the Chimani are suddenly living in these stable communities. They overhunt the regions, don't allow like the populations to redevelop, and they're not they're more relying more on heavy duty cash cropping. And so in collaboration with the demonization of these gods, the shaman is sort of obsolete in some way. He's the gods that he talks to are not important, plus nobody's asking for his permission or his, his good works to do anything. So it all sort of disappeared. Mm -hmm. But then there's, I mean, it's not over yet, which is sort of one of the interesting parts about the Chimani. So I mentioned one of these shamans' apprentices. There are, new no, there are no new shamans, but some of the apprentices of past shamans are still alive. Mm -hmm. And so they continue telling stories. And so kids are actually very aware of you know, the different kinds of gods and why they're important, but their actual sort of appeasement is absent. Um, so it's sort of an interesting, interesting. kind of development. And, wrote, and it, it, the Chimai Council has been writing a lot of education books, and they've done a really good job of including those mythologies in the education books, and so they're also learning it that way without the practice of it. Because replacing one foreign ideology, mythology, with um, using that to replace the native one is kind of a waste. They listen to Chimani Bible radio, so the, um, the evangelicals set up this radio station, and three times a day they have, I don't think, it's not a mass, but they have like religious, a religious programming in Chimani where they sing very typical religious sermony songs but in Chimani. And the Chimani sing them a lot as if they're pop music. Mm -hmm. And I've always sort of wondered, you know, um, you wonder if it, somehow all that message is being internalized. But I don't actually see it internalized. It seems like there's sort of a separation between it is somebody else's thing that happens to be in Chimani, which is nice, versus we really are into it. And I mean, they're not going to church. They're not. They're not. They're not and do they have not not initiation ceremonies with singing and stuff? No. I don't actually think they ever did. Um, so the older, uh, the Nordenskjold, um, which is the oldest record that we have, that he describes them as being unadorned and very boring. So, <laughs> so like he, How long was he? Which, I don't know. I don't know. But there has never been a good record of any of these, of any sort of, sort of singing and dancing initiation Just, records. It's, um, with the um, Holmberg's study, supposedly of these British hunter-gatherers, uh, it also transpires that they were involved in secondary, very elaborate secondary burial cults, which are part of one of the highest ceremonial systems, the funerary cult. So uh, it seems like there's not very accurate. Um, I'm sure not, but I don't. I don't know because it's not sure. Although the archaeology would have some of that. Yeah, um, Ariel, uh, thanks. I really was impressed with just the intimacy of this, uh, the research, uh, and the exactitude of your descriptions, and the in, the um, the intricate logic of the uh, of, of the way you put the, your explanation, your interpretation together. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the in terms of the argument 
it's a basically a, it's ultimately a functionalist argument. That is, the Chumani change their practices because the world is changing around them and they're adapting to that. Uh, and you find that they're making a logical adaptation. I mean, everything seems to fit into the changing ecology, the changing um, set of material um, uh, surroundings, and they are sort of adapting um, a little like the uh, classic study of the Lynn's showed in about Middletown in the 1920s of uh, how Americans you know, were in fact changing their material surroundings, but they were holding on as best they could to what they called the Middletown spirit or you know, traditional views of things. And it seems like you're saying that Shimani are sort of doing the same thing. But um, the, the question I have is kind of about the, your method and how you chose to, you know, to deploy your the story as you tell it. And I guess the one qu the question in the back of my mind is, for all the intimacy and the intricacy of the interpretation, why aren't we hearing the Chamani's view of it? Um, and that, in particular, uh, you know, it's clear that you have to be there uh, a lot of the time with these people. Um, how are they, I, I guess I'd like to know, how are they interpreting the very transformations that you're describing? Um, for example, this question of substituting, you know, plantains for manioc, or the change from chewing to not chewing, masticating, you know, you're, you're imputing a set of what seem like very reasonable logics and assumptions, but why the imputation as opposed to direct um, testimony? Well, you saw my dissertation <laughs> filled with that, but um, I did do these very large dietary histories, and in those, people explain to me what changed, why it changed, and how it changed. And um, rather than putting them in, in here, this is sort of the results of that. So, um, I mean, two of the big things that always came out of the dietary histories were the ingredients have changed because of a couple of reasons. It was always about outsiders coming in. It was about Chimani coming towards like population booms of Chimani, and then the third one is climate change and big events which have made it more complex. I took that one out of this because it's its own sort of thing and why that's in, why it's important. And it's also in, in very small event. It's in you know yearly events, but not constant. And the second thing they talked about is meals. So every not every dietary history, but many of the diet history, dietary histories had these patterns of First, the ingredients change, but how do those ingredients change? It's always in <coughs> the notion of food. So when I said that in reference, they always reference Hona, it's usually, well, the Hona looked like this, but then, but then we didn't have any more manioc. I don't think they always know why there's no more manioc when they're talking in that way, but then we, ha but then we replaced it with plantains, and, but we still eat it every day. And so there's these stories about it that allow me to sort of find the relationships between the stories and put them in the paper like this. There are other places in more sort of informal conversations where I can ask more direct questions like, so, you know, why is there no more manioc? Or, you know, what happened there? And then they'll contend, then there's a conversation about the manioc specifically and why they don't plant it. And one, one thing that popped into my head immediately is where um, an older man says, I'm too old for this, you know, I am so tired, I have to go to work, and I don't have time to spend all my time planting these small crops, it takes so much work to plant all these different things, I leave it to the young people, and then he turns to his son, and his son said, I don't have time for this, I have to go work in wood, my wife needs medication, my baby needs to go to school, and he has a whole list of things, are why he doesn't plant manioc, so there's what you get from the dietary histories, which are these sort of themes, and then you can ask more direct questions in different settings, which flesh it out. Um, in some ways it's functionalist, but on the other ways it's, it's not. I mean, if it was functional, then you could, then, then I don't think any of the cooking would be important at all in some ways, because then you could say, well, they have the oil, and they have the aluminum pot, why not just fry it? 
that would also be a function of these changes. But they're making other decisions that are not necessarily functional, they're cultural, and they're about maintaining something else besides just the function of the food, or just because they have you know, the meat and the oil, they don't have to do it in that way, they're choosing to do it in a much more familiar way. Because the, the drink is a, a, has a social value in addition to, to the nutritional. You're, you're reminding me of what happened in Rwanda and Burundi under uh, Belgian co colonial rule, where the Belgians kept pushing more and more the cash cropping and stealing labor in a way. They, they were, unlike this situation, they forced people to do unpaid labor for um, companies producing tea or um, doing timber, whatever it happened to be. So one thing that happened, people complained, is they didn't have any time to make their own food. This was observed also by uh, researchers. So uh, just the cash cropping situation, um, it crowded out their own food productions. And it sounds to me like that's what's happening to the manioc. I, think so. I have a question that goes back to the issue of globalization, um, and I, I think that, um, uh, as I understood you talking about the particular, the, either the drink, the beer, or the, the little animal, what's it called? The coffee the, the, Yeah, um, that both of those had a kind of spiritual content, and what happened, is, if I understood you correctly, what happened with globalization is that people continue to eat those, or in the case of the animal, not, I mean, they didn't eat it, now they eat it. But the, so they've transformed the form of the food, or the, the content of the food, but what's missing is the spiritual part. And I wonder if that's part of globalization. I mean, if there's some way in which the spirituality that it was associated with food has disappeared, and if that's some function of it. I mean, what you think about that in terms of, you know, the changes that globalization made. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually. And what, one of the questions would be, well, so how do you sort of see them in comparison to other things? So why would the spirituality disappear while the social relationships maintain? Is there something more you know, tangible about that kind of relationship that allows it to continue. It sort of talks to Anna's question is, I mean, is it because of religion, the globalization of religion, that the spirituality disappears? Or is it about the, the, the arrival of the markets? And, and I think it's a mixture of a lot of things, and that's sort of the kind of globalization I'm talking about is one that is not direct. It's sort of all of these sort of abstract things working together and not actually directly changing the capybara's consumption or not, but changing the things around the capybara, which in turn change the capybara. And so I don't know if its spirituality is, is a, like a, a product of, the lack of spirituality is a product of globalization. In this particular case, I mean, you could argue the opposite, that the influence of evangelical missions across the world is globalization, and that's more spirituality, but a different kind. But does that operate in their food system? You know that art, the article, um, Christianity and Canned Sardines, about Papua New Guinea? Uh, do you know that article? Well, so there's an article about, <laughs> mission, about missionaries in Papua New Guinea who bring canned sardines because they think that you know, the fishing and, and the hunting is nonsense, and they bring canned sardines. And, and they say, well, you know, part of being a Christian is being clean and you know, maintaining clean food processes. And then, and then they stop, they stop knowing how to fish and rely on the canned sardines, and then they can't afford the canned sardines, and we all know the rest of that story. <laughs> but, but so in some ways, it does impact the spirituality in some way. And if they're telling you that, if the spirits, if the Christianity says, you know, all those fish gods are are demons and not worth your time, then that sort of impacts the food. System. There must be some authority that's... that the there must be some way the um, missionaries are, are um, employing authority and probably value. There's probably some money involved, and there may be some kind of punishment involved. Have you heard anything about the way that the missionary ideas have been implemented and pushed on people? I think it's more through a system of uh, benefits, so healthcare, ah. education. Mm -hmm. ah. 
access to to small agricultural I ventures. Mm -hmm. I don't think sense. there's any threat. That makes sense. It's like Vanya Smith's work in Northeast Mexico on uh, health uh, concepts and the development, the central Mexican government um, giving money to women who would restrict their births and take part in the in their treatment of gynecologic um, things. And so there, were, there was kind of a drop in the uh, shaman, shamanistically related um, health endeavors. Um, there, but there money was, but there was a lot of force there. People would be slapped and they were rebuked harshly. Um, so um, I don't, I, that doesn't seem to have been the case that you're talking about. No, but there's still, what, sorry, Brian. Um, yeah, this is sort of a follow-up on uh, Sue's question. Um, I, I had a couple questions about your, you made two claims about globalization at the very end in, in the conclusion, and I had questions about those. Um, the, the first one, um, you talked about how globalization uh, is sort of, like this exemplifies how globalization is experienced in uneven ways. And I just, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned, like, okay, here are a couple different common ways of talking about globalization, and then you mentioned a third way, and I, it, it just seems like your claim at the end sounded, sounded close to the second way that you mentioned at the beginning, and I, but I feel like you sort of indicated you wanted to kind of differentiate what you were doing slightly from that. So I just, could you maybe talk more about how your claim is different from the... So the two popular like, ways of dealing with it are that globalization leads to homogeneity, and everyone's going to be the same. And within that, there's sort of a global inequality, those who have and those who have not on a global scale. And then the second doesn't really deal with that inequality, and it talks about, about heterogeneity, and as in small places, do their own thing. But one of the things that comes out of that second heterogeneity that has a lot of, there's a lot of criticism out, about it, is that it doesn't actually deal with the global. It sort of makes itself be apart from the global. It's something separate. It's an alternative and that it's its own kind of thing. And what um, the definition of food globalization is that I put up is a much more plural approach, thinking about the global in relationship to a much more local situation. What I wanted to show is those food globalizations should spend more time thinking about places where there are not direct mega development projects or places where it's not so clear to say they're being exploited or places where it's not so clear that there is, I don't know, the extraction of oil or gas, yet that might very well happen in the next three years. But the idea is that globalization happens everywhere, but it, its impact is sort of unequal. So not that, not in the inequality of the economics where those who gain and there those who lose, but the feeling of globalization, the actual interaction with it, that's not equal in every place, but it somehow exists and is and is worked with with um, more local factors. That's what you meant by okay. invisibility. Yeah. Okay. Well, can I ask a follow-up question? So, I mean, um, well, so um, like the second claim you made um, about there being not just loss but change. Yeah. Um, I, to me, it seems like maybe there's sort of two kind of distinct definitions of loss implicit in that sense. There's the like, the kind of loss like the Chimani guy who now has less time to do anything but, you know, produce commodity crops and, he, and now has less food or less like, like the fish are smaller, <laughs> like, the, like a sort of that kind of loss. And then there's the kind of loss of, we used to do it, things one way, now we do them differently. Um, and I, I, to me, those are just sort of categorically different. And the, re the reason why I would be, I'm interested to hear, the reason I'm bringing this up is because you say something at the very end, and I can't remember your exact phrase, but it's something like, and this is important to think about in terms of, I think the phrase was like food subsistence or something like that. Security. Food security. And that, because it, it just seemed like one kind of, one kind of loss or gain would be very relevant to think about food security. One would be maybe less immediately relevant, sort of changes in traditions. There's the question of like survival, and then there's the question of sort of changing cultural traditions. So I guess, can you say more about that thing you said at the end about the connection? Yeah, I'll start a little bit before though with mm -hmm. the loss and the gain. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I didn't just say loss, I said loss, and then there's also negotiations and resistance and gains. Mm -hmm. So those three things are actually very different. And so I think there is the loss of biodiversity, and there's a loss of giant animals, and there's a loss of big fish. I think that's clear. Um, but the resistance to just accepting those things as they are, that's sort of the gain, is to be able to push back and say, these things might, might disappear, but we're not just going to sit here and only eat the commodities, we're going to transform the commodities, or we're going to find other ways to support the family that looks similar to the way they were. It's not that the loss happens and we all just fall to pieces and die. It's much more, it's much more than that. It's how do we survive over time? And in terms of gains, there's, the, there's more than just food. There's the purchase of all kinds of commodities, which before they had no access to, but saw other people in the region having access to. So those motors for the boats, the chainsaws, um, to buy soccer cleats, to buy generators, all of these things are things that they think of as gains. Look, we couldn't afford this before, but look at what we can afford now. And, and so it would be, as Leon pointed out, an, an interpretation to say that that's bad. But it's, I mean, they see it as good, look at what we can afford. And then in terms of food security, it's, it's, that res it's that resistance and negotiation. Look at all these changes, but how do we make sure that the family, when the men are at least home, because <laughs> the food security changes, I think, from moment to moment, but how can we say that things are familiar, that it's not changing beyond our control, that it's not just about losing the diversity or the big animals, how can we make our home life feel secure through food? So it's not a nutritional definition of food security, it's a much more social and cultural definition of food security, which sort of talks the way I think the way that Chimani see food is not really about what they're consuming, but what they know about food. So, so that's really what I mean by food security. And that way, I think it's loss and there's loss and gain. So, um, this is also, I guess, sort of about globalization. Um, so, one of the nice things of the, of the heart of your paper was there, there was a lot of precision on exactly what's going on, that cooking is the same and the ingredients are changing. And it was really interesting to, to kind of see kind of stability and change that you were able to describe using these really kind of fairly detailed uh, descriptions and categories, and that the social function was preserved even though the religious function was up. But then globalization is just this kind of thing in the background that doesn't have any of the kind of, in your presentation, any of the analytic precision of the, of the stuff you're using in the heart of your talk. And, and I, I, just, I was just kind of struck by that. It, by making it abstract, it, it, you've almost removed its explanatory value. It's just, it's just whatever it is that's making, changing the background conditions that they're responding to. It, and it's not itself uh, an explanatory force. And, uh, this isn't... No, no, no I, but actually that's exactly what I intend to do. Okay, so, so, so that, so for that, let me just follow up. And, I, and I'm not actually, this is, this is like, I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with this. This isn't an objection, I just want to say that. Which is, um, in a way, that's a kind of debunking of the idea of globalization. And, and I just, I guess I just wanted you to comment on whether you really mean it in, in that way. It's not, it's not something you can appeal to to explain what's going on here. Um, well, I think I, I think that tropes about globalization are so big and so like grandiose that they do miss these places where globalization happens, and it's not happening in such like a, a direct, impactful way. And, that, and that's really my point: is that there are places where people and food don't move, but they still feel the influence of global processes somewhere else, and so. When I gave that sort of very long history of what happened in the region, they've sort of been dealing with global relationships since the 16th century. And that, I think, is profound because people assume that groups like the Chimani are isolated. Actually, almost all of the papers written about the Chimani start off with saying they are autarkic. 
But they're clearly not, and they've clearly been engaged for a really long time. But yet globalization discussions never talk about people like this, who are sort of mis- and I guess the I guess the writers are more misinformed than anyone else in assuming that, that they have no interaction. Because just because you're a subsistence farmer for most of the time doesn't mean that you're not engaged with these things that are happening around you. And so, you know, there's some there's a lot of deliberateness in my choosing to talk about globalization in this way, is that I think it's important to pay attention to places where it's not obvious and where people aren't moving and where the foods aren't moving. And they're sort of dealing with it as it's filtered through regional processes and the assumption that regional processes are regional and national processes are regional, indigenous rights are regional, conservation is regional. But in fact, these are all related to larger issues globally where they're making relationships between each other, they're lear countries are learning from other countries, and so they don't always appear to be global, but they are. And that's sort of why I choose it this way. And I do understand that there's this maybe a separation between talking about the global and then talking about this kind of change. But in some ways that's the point, it's just to make, the, make a semblance of a, of a connection between where these changes are stemming from, that they're not just so local, and that's why they're important. Can, can I just follow up just really yeah. briefly? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me the way you're using the word globalization and I really am way, way far from home, by the way, right now, <laughs> intellectually. <laughs> Uh, it just it's just a, it just means interaction with the rest of the world of whatever kind and I, and I had and I'll just finish and then you can respond and I had the impression that there in the social sciences there's this use where it, it has this more specific meaning where it's some bad thing not just all the interaction but a specific kind of bad interaction and, and I, anyway you just, well no you're actually very right but there are many <coughs> many different different definitions of globalization, uh -huh. and there's a lot of pushback to these sort of like end of the world, it's economic force, and it's all about media, and you know, it's about the West controlling everyone else, and in fact, that's not really globalization, but you know, rethinking what that means for everyday people is a whole different ballgame, and I think it requires to not just rely on this giant negativity, but really to think about what it means in practice. Yeah, no, my question is, is um, about labor, I guess, and work, because that's, well, what's very interesting to me is that like, when you talk a little bit about the people you interviewed, it was, it was men, I think, who you just happened to cite in this talk, like, sort of, and they were all talking about the work that they do, and what's, what it seems like, what the real change is in relationship to food, I mean, I think, is that you, work used to be, men's work used to be directly tied, direct food acquisition, right, and now men are working for money and they go shopping, right, and so one thing that's interesting about that is that the shopping actually it used to be that men's contact with food was primarily in terms of hunting, which meant it was meat, right, as their main. But now I guess they're buying the flour and the oil and the onions and the other things too. So that, that on the one hand, the sort of gender, presumably, I don't know if it matters if they feel differently about bringing home flour and oil, you know, versus the meats, because that's like a big change. But then more interestingly, I thought it was interesting that you then focus on cooking, which is still women's labor, right? So that women's labor, in that sense, women's food, women's food work has remained, it seems you're saying, sort of really the same. They keep cooking. Right, even though their techniques change, whereas men's labor is just radically, radically different. Like and men would have cooked as well. They would usually be the barbecue. Why don't you let, why don't you let Ariella respond? Yeah. yeah, no, but I, mean, I thought, because it seemed like men were acquiring certain means. It seemed like women's, so the next minute is the question. Like women were, I guess, doing some agricultural work and cooking, and then men were hunting. Yeah. And in any case, I was wondering, are women, is women, are women perceiving their food work as say, staying the same? And do men talk about their relationship to work and food? You know what I mean? Like, that just seems, yeah, that's, I guess, my general. So the men talk about their relationship between work and food all the time. Okay, yeah. It's the point of their work in some ways. So they still, yeah, that's yeah, so and, and so even though the actual work has changed, the point of the work sort of remains the same. Um, so it's still to bring home food. food. Okay. Um, and, and the women, it has changed. So even though they continue to, to hold a lot of responsibility in the agriculture, also in gathering, mm -hmm. um, the kind of agricultural work that they're doing is cash copping. It's not just men who are in charge of that. Women, they, they on the day-to-day -day basis, they spend a lot of time in the fields, you know, weeding and making sure that there are no pests and keeping the plantings from falling down in a windstorm and harvesting, and they do a lot of work. They don't always go to town, but they do a lot of labor moving the plantains from the chacos, their fields, 
to the to the ports, and so it does change for them. And as I mean, they're also demanding some of those things that the men are bringing home. Just because it's flour doesn't make it less demanded by the woman. Yeah. So, so they're spending a lot of time, you know, making sure that the money is going to come in and that there will be food at least when the men are, are there. The big, for me, the big thing, and I tried to hint at this, is that is that the distribution is changing when men leave. So that that is new. It used to be that people would go to ranches maybe for two weeks or three weeks, but but the families went with them, they would all work together. And now to when you do logging, the men go by themselves and are in a big man group and they cook together. And so their their cooking changes, but also it changes what women are sort of left with. And I've seen a couple of women just get so fed up that they, you know, tempted to hunt or or went fishing. And they're they're pretty successful at fishing because as kids everybody sorts of just goes to the river. But um, but hunting not so much, and so you know they're sort of changing also in that particular moment. But that moment is not all the time. So um, so so labor is really important. It's really the thing that that connects to the food. But labor continues to be directly related to food with that sort of question. So, Jeff? I have uh, a comment as well as a question. Um, the comment sort of dovetails on what they had to say about globalization. I'm not so sure if I if I agree with the characterization of globalization that you offer. At least as far as it seems like it seems like the form of, of globalization that's associated with the old McWorld McDonaldization arguments of the 90s, right? Which were criticized back then. So I don't really know how helpful it is as a way of framing this particular conversation because there have been so many criticisms both on the streets from anti-globalization, you know, <coughs> drug movement. But then, uh, you know, from all, all men are academics. So I'm not, I don't think it's really so helpful. Maybe it's just, you know, maybe it's just me, but I don't really know if that's really the way to, to frame it. Um, the more substantive question I have deals with the implications of this cultural change for the health of the Shimani. Um, you know, in the sense that, you know, if we do take the, the McDonaldization arguments, that there, there's always these changes whenever particular sorts of market commodities are introduced, diets are altered. So I just want to know a little bit more about, you know, have, have people's li lives changed as well in terms of health, along with the changes in their livelihoods and their consumption patterns? So I don't do much with nutrition. I'm just going to be honest about that from the get-go. But there are other studies on the Chinami looking at, um, looking at a couple things. One is stress and heart disease. And then the other, uh, well, I guess there are three. One is about stress and heart disease. One is about um, pesticides pests and um, getting giardia and tapeworm, things like that. And then the third has been about um, activity levels, so burning calories over time. And so all of them sort of engage with look at all these commodity foods that they're eating now. This is different from how it was. They're not hunting all the time. Um, basically that sort of discussion. And so um, in the topics on stress, it seems that Chimani have not really had any differences in their heart issues yet. Um, there's many other studies of indigenous groups that show over time that that, that will probably happen. Um, but the activity, the activity section of that seems to imply that they're maintain they're not sedentary and they're still maintaining the same high levels of activity they were doing before, just it's different activities. And so in that way, that's sort of been able to balance out the rise of sugars and fats. Um, and then the third one about pests and, um, and uh, other kinds of parasites, um, that has a lot to do with settlement patterns. So when you're staying in you know, permanent villages and the, the bathrooms are not very far, or your, your kids are walking through the, the forest and they go to the bathroom and then you step in it and it moves, it moves around in this way, that seems to be you know the big the big threat, and there was a development project recently that tried to bring um, bring latrines or teach people how to build latrines and also how to wear <coughs> flip flops. And the flip flops stayed on, like caught on a little bit because they're very inexpensive in town, so people are willing to to buy them. Also, when you go to town, you look less shimani if you're wearing flip flops and if you're barefoot. So that's been like a social thing that's happened. <coughs> But um, the latrines are sort of 
some people have them and some people don't, and so that's really one, one of the ways these studies have worked. But so far there aren't big changes in the, the health issue according to these studies. I don't do that, so, so I don't know so much about it, but what I've read implies that they're not dealing with the same obesity, hypertension, and big sorts of cardiovascular problems that generally happen in these situations because of maintained activity level. Can I hop in a sure. follow-up question like that? Did they say anything about their health? About, you know, how, how fatigued they were, or their kids being shorter? Protein is definitely going down, and it shows up in kids being shorter, and they notice things like that. Did they, did they volunteer anything in your, in your, your interviews? Nothing about children in my interviews. I didn't ask, so that could be a yeah, but, but in general, there was here. talk about being tired, about backs hurting, um, injuries on the job, especially especially because of the weight of the chainsaws. Mm -hmm. They're so, so, so heavy, and that's a new kind of like well healthiness that they're not so accustomed to. So some people, there's their arms would hurt and their lower backs would hurt. Um, I started to see people wearing belt, you know, like weight belts. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they must have figured that out from other non shimani loggers that that's a way to sort of fix the problem or hold off the problem, but um, they did talk, they do talk about being tired a lot. And now be the men talking about it. The men, I think the women, but the women with the plant, carrying the plantains. Also. Because it's not just one bunch, it's very typical for a woman to, um, to harvest one large bunch you carry on your head and on your back like this, but one weighs a lot. But when you're doing it constantly to bring those plantains to the river, it's really stressful and it hurts. And so they do talk about that. And so I've seen people buy wheelbarrows to sort of fix that problem, but that still only takes three at a time, and it, wheelbarrow is still very difficult because of the lifting. Um, I think we we talked a little bit about this when we talked about your writing in the writing group context. But um, I I think um, I. I am sympathetic to what Cedric just said about the globalization debates. I think, um, I mean, I, I do, I do understand um, how you're using them as sort of um, as a counterweight to the idea that these people are remote and that they're not affected by globalization and all of those. And and that's really important because um, you know. Uh, you, you can imagine all sorts of contexts in which people would be in this area for a short time and, and believe that these were um, remote people untouched by markets. Um, I, but, um, but I think, you know, for the, I think there is something about those debates that's, you know, been kind of worked over. Um, and I was, I was thinking, you know, that, that, that maybe a more, promising way to get into those issues is through all this stuff you already have on labor. I mean, that's so, um, you know, that is, that's such an important avenue of the globalization um, that you're talking about, and, and there are ways you can talk about labor value and connect that <coughs> to some of the commodities literature that I think would, um, might be a little more refined, which, you know, might help you make the argument more refined and maybe a little bit, um, you know, carve out a little bit better your contribution to that. Not, but it related to that, I was sort of wondering if you could speak to that about how significant um, Chimani labor is to these forestry operations. Is that their only labor force? Um, so it's changed. So they're not working for the concessions. They refuse to work for the concessions. Okay. Um, but they were working for the highland migrants who were doing sort of illegal logging in the TCO, and then recently they started to do it, what they think is their own their own logging, but really they're still being hired by the highlanders, and the difference is being in charge of your own, um, your own management system. So you get a contract from a highlander who has this relationship to a buyer in, the, in La Paz or wherever, and then they pay you up front, and then you hire Chimani laborers, you buy the food, you rent the chainsaw or buy your own chainsaw, you are in charge of the gas, you're in charge of the provisions. So a Chimani becomes important as the sort of the labor boss, while it used to be a Highlander, and that seems to be the big shift. And Chimani would 
they've told me, I mean, this is the common thing that they say, is I would never work for somebody else, but I'll work for another Chinani. Like, I don't want to work for an outsider. The, the way they demand hours is not reasonable. The way they expect things from us is unreasonable. So I, they would rather not work than work for someone else. So are they so there are Chimani labor contractors who are then um, g gathering other Chimani exactly so they work in sort groups. of extended family groups so a household head might get the contract and then hire his son to be the to be the chainsaw operator and then will hire his other son and his nephew and his brother to be the the other loggers in the in the team and so they sort of run that separately. So, I mean, that would be, I just, I would encourage you to look at that a little more because that's, a, I mean, that's the main way that labor in Mexico, in southern Mexico from the highlands, Maya labor has been sort of provided to coffee plantations in the lowlands and in these, um, by, by organizing these labor contract arrangements um, and in, in sort of complicated ways and probably different <coughs> in your situation, but it might be really, you know, really Piece. So, just, Dan, one, one more question. So, uh, in a way, this is a question in spirit of Leon's question earlier. So, you described the, the effects of globalization as including losses and gains, but also negotiation and resistance. And then you described some of the changes and what they were holding on to in cooking practices as ingredients changed as an example of resistance. And I think from an out side perspective, I can see how it would be uh, a tempting way of describing what's happening, but I was wondering how the Shimani themselves view the kinds of changes. Is it, are they just thinking they're adapting to circumstances? Well, I don't have the manioc, so now I get to stick in plantains. Or are they thinking of it as, I want to maintain a tradition, or am I resisting the changes and so on? So just a question whether the trope of resistance, which is an attractive one, is itself sort of an imposition. How do they view it? I think that's a good question, and one that I probably should rethink a little bit. So in, I think it's a mixture of resistance, and it's a mixture of just dealing with the, what's happening. So in some, I mean, why, it's kind of the same example. So when, when you have, sort of all of these things that you can cook like an outsider. Why don't you cook like an outsider? And so when people talked about Kona, they talk about it in a way that, that it's about family and maintaining family and actively making sure that the food is in equal parts given to all members of the family, that that small amount of meat is, still, is distributed equally. It's, that is not say, like that's a different thing than saying, well, I have oil and I have meat, why don't I just fry it because that's what other people do outside. It's a, cho it's a choice and I think that that choice is resisting all the impacts of outside while choosing others. Whether it's resistance for the question of always maintaining family or sometimes it's because that's all they have and they have to make it stretch further, that's it. maybe you're right that resistance is sort of an interpretation sometimes. But other times, I think, when they're making a choice between that and something else, which they know how to cook in other ways, but they're still cooking in familiar ways, I think that is a form of resistance, whether or not it's declared as such or it's an active choice. That could be Sometimes familiarity is, is enough. I mean, just inertia. I mean, the kids yeah. demand the kids demand other things. And the mothers will say, that's not real food. That's resistance. <laughs> That's resistance. <laughs> well, let's think, I mean, uh, and, uh, <laughs>